Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think I want to start off, first of all, you know, acknowledging that today is National Sneakers Day. And before I comment on my colleague's sneakers, from the one who was wearing a Bata sneaker, to the one who had the colors of the national flag, to the one who forgot his yellow sneakers, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think we need to... <laughs> I think we need to focus the buy, one, the, 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 one, the buy one, get one free sneakers, yes. Mr. Speaker. I think the important point about National Sneakers Day, Mr. Speaker, is that it forces us to focus on healthy lifestyles. At a time when we are concerned about rising diseases in our society, um, and we all should be concerned about taking care of ourselves and ensuring that we live as healthy lifestyles as possible, Today is a reminder for us to be more active. And of course, wearing sneakers is associated with a more active lifestyle. And we want to thank the NIC for promoting that consciousness. And I'm, I'm really pleased that, you know, most of the colleagues, um, except the member from Beaufort South, who seem to have forgotten here to wear his sneakers today, uh, is not a <laughs> But if there's one person among us who, displays a healthy lifestyle is him. I mean, he, he's, he's, had, he's had many, many years um, to, to, to show that. Um, but I'm sure he woke up this morning, went on his farm and picked a few Akis. Um, the Prime Minister boasts that he produces Akis in his farm. You have more than Akis. Well, so, they don't have your size. <laughs> yeah. There are no sneakers your size, they say. <laughs> anyway, um, Mr. Speaker, but it's a really important initiative, and I think we should um, commend the NIC for doing so. Mr. Speaker, the, the bill before us is an important bill. There's so many persons, children, descendants of persons of St. Lucian origin by birth, who have a desire to get citizenship. And during my time when I served in the High Commission in, in London, Mr. Speaker, uh, there were quite a few second generation St. Lucians who wanted citizenship, and you had to explain to them that whereas their grandparents were from St. Lucia, migrated to the United Kingdom, their parents were not born in St. Lucia, but acquired citizenship by descent. And therefore, it did not qualify them to become citizens. And I've come across many footballers, for example, um, in the UK who wanted to represent St. Lucia, but they would not qualify for that purpose. There were many professionals who wanted citizenship and could not get it. There's also the situation, Mr. Speaker, where an individual may be studying overseas and his wife or his partner have a child overseas, you know, almost no see of the child to be born overseas while the parents are studying. And their children, if they're not born overseas, also don't qualify because of the simple fact that the parent happened to have been born overseas. And I, I know that particular circumstance because, you know, it, it applies to me, Mr. Speaker, in one, in one case. But we've had so many situations before of, of persons wanting citizenship but cannot get it, even though your grandparents were from St. Lucia. And I, I think this is a most welcome amendment. It's also more welcome, Mr. Speaker, because about four years, five, six years ago, under the CIP program, an amendment was made which already allowed that to happen to some extent. So the last government made an amendment where persons who acquired citizenship through investment, not both, their children that could become a St. Lucia once they applied for citizenship and went through the process. So you had in that instance under the CIP, persons who acquired citizenship not through birth could bestow it onto their children, but St. Lucians, you know, by descent, could not get it. And this, in a sense, corrects that. So persons who were not born in St. Lucia can pass on citizenship, in this case, where the grandparents were born in St. Lucia. But under the CIP, it was already possible for somebody to pass on citizenship if the parent, in that case, who got it through citizenship, um, and of course not born in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, whilst I'm saying that in the Citizenship by Investment Program, they already had some sort of accommodation 
for persons whose parent was not born in St. Lucia to become a citizen. It gives me an ideal opportunity to make a few remarks about the Citizenship by Investment Program, Mr. Speaker, and I trust, Mr. Speaker, that you'll allow me uh, to do so. Because a lot has been said over the last few days, few weeks. There is a constant daily, you know, running announcements about CIP, CIP, CIP. And it really makes you wonder, what is this all about? What is this all about? Why such an attack on the image and the reputation of St. Lucia through the CIP? Why the actions of the opposition in this particular regard? And like I said, every single day is an attack upon myself, is an attack upon the program. Mr. Speaker, I want to start off by saying to you, the Prime Minister has made it very clear, and in his leadership he has said to us, we must always protect the integrity of St. Lucia. In the conduct of our business, we avoid as much as possible at naming and shaming companies that may have, in their discussions with the last government, the agreements with the last government, probably crossed the line a few times. We did not go out and publish documents about them. We did not name and shame them. We acted as a responsible government. We sat down in meetings and we sought to correct what we thought was wrong. We believe at the end of the day, the government of St. Lucia is continuous. Doesn't matter which party is in power. We want always investors from anywhere in the world to have confidence when they come to invest in St. Lucia. Not to believe that if a government changes, documents will be made public and persons will chastise companies and reveal information about their dealings, their commercial agreements, to their embarrassment. We don't believe in that. Because St. Lucia must come first. So even when we are not happy, we have to try to correct it and put it on course and make sure we represent the best interests of St. Lucia. Because St. Lucia is not just about this moment. It's about the future as well. The future generations that will inherit the seat of government like we do now. And we have not gone about doing this. And the opposition has, keeps pushing us, pushing us, pushing us, Mr. Speaker. And like a colleague said, they are prepared to burn down the house, and the house being St. Lucia, just to kill a roach, not even a rat, a roach. And in the belief that if they come back in, they can rebuild it. Think about that mentality. To get power back at all costs, and by any means necessary. Because they believe if they destroy the country, once they are in power, it will be okay. But we know that's not really true. They don't need to destroy St. Lucia. If you believe you have a better alternative to what exists now, put your case to the people of St. Lucia. And you notice they started campaigning. Every day they're campaigning. But we're not campaigning yet. We're working. We're delivering for the people of St. Lucia. And it got so offensive, Mr. Speaker, during one of our official opening ceremonies for the Miku Jetty. They got so irate and so desperate, they said we were opening a toilet for the people of Miku. And they said the whole cabinet went to witness it. Think about that. The leader of the opposition. That the jetty is really a toilet for the people of Miku. Think about it. That's what you think of the very people that for years have supported the United Workers Party. For years. But that's just a reflection of how desperate they are. Just how desperate they are. So the leader of the opposition says a lot of things. And I want this morning, for the record, Mr. Speaker, to, to respond to a couple of points he's made. First of all, there are numbers banding around 7,000. Where did you get 7,000 from? Martinez said it. So your source of information is Martinez, a man that, you, that he established a relationship with to meet his own objectives, which is to destroy the image and reputation of St. Lucia. And I'll come back to that. So the numbers you are claiming is you're saying, Martinez told you McLeod said it, but McLeod said he never said those things. 
So what's the basis for the numbers? And he keeps saying things about infrastructure option. I'm going to ask the unit to issue a memo on the infrastructure program and guidelines so it can be all agents and everyone. Because he says it's a secret, a secret option. Something that was gazetted on December 20th, I think it was. Gazetted on December 20th. The option was gazetted. He had, we waited an entire month for him to file a negative resolution in case he opposed it. He never did. Think about that. He says it's secret in the Gazette. The unit sent out a, pro, a memo on 1st of February announcing that the program is, uh, the option has been launched. He said, I said in my address, it's March, and how can I say March when the memo was February, and that means it was secret. Listen to the, listen to the logic of the leader of the opposition. The memo said first, I said March. Okay, I can always explain why we said March, but that means it was secret. How can something that was announced be secret? How can something that was announced be secret? How can something that was gazetted be secret? But, Mr. Speaker, it tells you the desperation. Why do they want the infrastructure option to fail? Why? It's very simple, Mr. Speaker. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, you're the leader of the opposition, and you're hearing the government is launching an infrastructure option where over 100 million US dollars will be spent on improving roads, building houses, building community facilities. Wouldn't you get scared? Wouldn't you get scared that two years before elections, the government is announcing an infrastructure option that will transform the infrastructure of this country? They have to be scared. And for an opposition that is totally incompetent, is loud, abusive, you know, attacking the character of all individuals, persons not even in public life like us. They must be scared, Mr. Speaker. The fright that this program will succeed and the government will be reelected is what has them so desperate. It's called political panic, Mr. Speaker. And he's under pressure. So he wants it to fail. And he will do anything to make sure it fails. Even calling on the revocation of visa-free access, Mr. Speaker. Think about that. A leader of the opposition, somebody who was a prime minister of this country, virtually calling on our international partners to watch us and speaking about revocation of visa-free access. He even goes as far as speaking about the banking, correspondent banking may be lost. Why are you saying that? Why? Because in his mind, if he can create the impression that there is so much confusion and corruption and scandal and this thing is so bad, maybe some people will start listening. He writes a letter about five pages to the leader of the opposition. Here it is. To the, to the, prime, to the prime Minister. Prime minister. He, signed it. he signed it. He records his address to the nation on the Wednesday, in secret, on Wednesday. He sends a letter to the, leader, the Prime Minister on the Friday afternoon. So I already knew what was in the letter because, St. Lucia, you can't have too many secrets. You know, I'm sure a lot of members around here know. Just about everywhere you go, people know where you go. You understand? <laughs> so, on the Sunday now, he addresses the nation to speak about the letter that he only gave on Friday night, not even the, giving the Prime Minister some chance to digest it and maybe give him a response. It shows you that there was no sincerity in that letter. But he copies it to a number of persons. And it's not the first time he has done that. He wrote a letter earlier, copied it to the IMF, to the IMF and the World Bank, CDB. He copied it to all embassies because the government took a loan that was going to finance the hosting of World Cup cricket. And may I say, Mr. Speaker, we must say kudos to our colleague, Minister, for the leadership that he showed in preparing St. Lucia to host the matches. Complaining about the government taking a loan, Mr. Speaker, to host Cricket World Cup and to improve the sporting infrastructure in this country. He finds that unacceptable. Uh, to guarantee a loan, not even take a loan, to guarantee a loan. Thank you very much, colleague.
But that's the thinking of the leader of the opposition. That's the thinking of him. Why do you want to desecrate the good name of St. Lucia? Why? Because this is your pathway to get back into power? But Mr. Speaker, I'm often told by friends of mine that evil thinks what evil does. Evil thinks what evil does. And the leader of the opposition and the, mem and the senator, Dominic Fide, always makes statements. And sometimes, one thing, Mr. Speaker, I listen to criticism. Some people tell me I should not listen to all those stories and all those criticisms. But I listen to it because sometimes there, there's validity in some of what is being said. It may not be totally true, but it causes you to reflect and to see probably where you fell short. It makes you a better person, a better professional. And they were saying things, Mr. Speaker. And there was a particular post about agents getting $20,000 and the calculating numbers. And I found it really bizarre. What's this all about? And I decided, let me ask a few questions in the unit. How did things happen under the United Workers Party government? And then, Mr. Speaker, information starts unearthing. You really don't want to put out in public some things, Mr. Speaker, because deep down inside, you still want to protect your country and its reputation. But it will push us over the line, Mr. Speaker. Because I will say to this morning, all the talk about underpricing and discounting was started by the last government in St. Lucia. That's where it started. That's where it started, Mr. Speaker. And I want them to challenge me and say something, and I'll start releasing information. Because, Mr. Speaker, there were persons in St. Lucia that directly benefited from it. Directly benefited from it. But they are shouting and they are accusing persons of doing things because they did it. And they assume people must be doing it too. Evil thinks what evil does, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will come back to this house because I'm sure they will answer me and I'll have to provide the evidence because I'm seeing it in this house. The rain situation, Mr. Speaker, no one who applied for citizenship through that range um, project paid the required amount they were supposed to pay. But Mr. Speaker, I'm waiting for the leader of the opposition to be there, to be there when I'm giving him the full story. I want him, Mr. Speaker, the same individual who is desecrating St. Lucia, same individuals attacking the character of all individuals and sending it all over the world. I want him to be there when I'm saying it. I want him to be there. I was waiting for him to be here this morning, but for some reason, he decided not to come. He said, I heard he's on vacation, Mr. He Speaker. Oh, he didn't have sneakers, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I'm sure the member from Srozel would have, you know, lent him one. But Mr. Speaker, we need to protect our country, and we'll do what we have to do to protect our country. We will disagree with the opposition, they will disagree with us, but there's no need to destroy our country. There's no need to do so, Mr. Speaker. And he's determined to make sure that the program fails and our country hurts as much as possible. Because he believes that's his pathway to get back into government, Mr. Speaker. But you know, on this side, we've just started working, Mr. Speaker. Just one Friday, just one Friday we had opening projects around the island and they got scared, Mr. Speaker, got scared. Just one Friday. I've not even started sort turning in my constituency yet, Mr. Speaker. I've not even started yet. So you can imagine when we start, Mr. Speaker. They were in Cassius East holding tongue hall meetings. You know, Mr. Speaker, you go to Marsha, you encourage the young people to come to your tongue hall meeting. They tell you they're supporting Philip J. Pierre. You encourage them to come to the meeting. So they came, but they came with their red shirts. Why should you get upset? They told you they're supporting Philip J. Pierre. You told them to come to the meeting. You gave them all the inducements to come. They came with their red shirts. You called police for them. But think about that. How could that be? But Mr. Speaker, the campaign will start one day, and they will have to respond accordingly, Mr. Speaker. So 
the leader of the opposition is not here today, so we'll get another chance, Mr. Speaker, to talk some more. But I wanted to make the point that the amendment we are making today already provide, is provided for under the CIP legislation. And that was done by the leader of the opposition when he was in government. So you will find my total support for the amendment. And I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.